Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael McNally of the AdSpam team, and I'll be introducing our guest speaker today. Um, if you go to uh, google.com and you start typing Dave, L-O-G, Psychic will autocomplete to Dave Logan. Uh, the first result will be a uh, retired uh, sports player. Second result will be a, a plumber. And the third result will be our guest, uh, Dave Logan of davelogan.com. Um, he's been a friend of mine since uh, our early teenage years. And uh, of uh, uh, the people that I've known from that peer group, he's been a um, great inspiration uh, to me personally. Um, he's been a great friend to have all these years. Um, Dave Logan is a uh, faculty member at the University of Southern California in the Marshall School of Business. Um, he's a best-selling author, um, and he's a management consultant. Uh, Dave, writing, writing with uh, Steve Zaffron, has co-authored The Three Laws of Performance, which is uh, currently a best-selling book within the organizational um, uh, behavior section of Amazon. Um, Dave is also uh, writing with his co-author, John King and Haley Fisher Wright has co-authored Tribal Leadership, uh, Leveraging Natural Groups to Build a Thriving Organization. That'll be the subject of uh, his presentation today. Um, just to mention, um, this book has been endorsed by David Allen. Um, David Allen is the author of the Getting Things Done series, which we've had uh, David Allen as a guest speaker a number of times, and uh, we've had a number of courses here based on his work. And this is what he says about David Logan. Um, tribal leadership should be required reading for anyone in teams or with an interest in improving performance and job satisfaction. So glowing endorsement. Um, Dave here has uh, served as a senior partner at CultureSync, uh, a management consulting firm which he co-founded in 1997. Um, and he's been also on the faculty of the USC Marshall School of Business, uh, the Getty Leadership Institute, and the International Center for Leadership and Finance. So uh, I'm very glad to welcome um, my friend and our guest speaker, Dave Logan. Well, thank you. Thank you, Michael. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here, and it's especially an honor to be introduced by, as Michael said, one of my, I won't say oldest friends, but longest friend. Anyway, you can grammatically, you know what I'm saying. Uh, OK, so here's what I thought might be an interesting use of time. Very much appreciate your, your showing up. Uh, knowing a bit about Google and knowing a lot of the people that are employed by Google tend to be let me just kind of rattle through what I suspect. Uh, number one, like way smarter than average, okay. Number two, pr pretty quick to seize on to new ideas and then want to think through the implications of those. And number three, that you tend to stay or comment kind of based on merit, so as opposed to you know, other things. So what I thought I would do, given those three assumptions, if you think those are valid, is to take a few minutes and show you what this framework is uh, and let me just say a little bit about it at this point and then, and then propose that and see if that works for all of you. So what this is based on is my, my co-authors and I spent the better part of 10 years looking at organizations trying to answer a question that was by no means unique to us, but we think that our answer was unique because the methodology was unique. And so what we sought to answer was not why are some organizations effective and others are not. I mean, that's a question that everybody asks. But the question is, what is it about some organizations, if you think of kind of leadership and the things that go along with leaders, if you imagine a, a checklist that good leaders should do, these five or six things, you can find organizations where leaders, in fact, do none of those things. And yet the place does really well by any objective measurements. And you can also find the reverse, where Leaders do all of those things, and yet the organization isn't working. Now, there are some easy ways to explain that away. You could say that, that the non-performing organization has a strategy that's the wrong one, or they're going after a market segment that's the wrong one. Let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that most of the obvious things were pretty much the same between those two organizations. So what you end up having is really a mental kind of puzzle to solve. I mean, really, why is it that some organizations simply do not need to be led and others don't respond to even a lot of leadership? That was kind of the premise going into this. And so what we came to, as I said, the methodology is unique, was instead of looking at the unit of analysis as being the person, so like you're a member of the you know, Google you know, set of companies, that, that's not that's, we didn't find that to be a, a useful unit of analysis, nor did we find the company to be a useful unit of analysis, or the department, or the business unit. Those are kind of traditional ones, or the team. So what we found to be kind of the, the 
key to understanding this whole thing was the fact that organizations exist and occur in what we call naturally occurring groups. And originally we called those NOGs, naturally occurring group or a NOG. And that idea is about as unsexy as you get. So in the process of kind of working in the big publishing system, HarperCollins happens to be the publisher of the book, we settled on the word tribe. Now the word tribe is Latin in origin, so I'm, this is in no way a reference to say the Native American traditions or you can go just about anywhere in the world and if you use the word tribe, people think you mean something particular by it. All I mean by it in this context is a group of people between roughly 20 and 150. Now let me comment on each of those and we'll jump into this, okay? So why 20? Well, because a lot of the literature on teams assumes that a team goes up to about 17, 18 people. And there's really good literature on teams about how they work. But then there's not a lot on this next gap, what we call a naturally occurring group. There's a lot at the organizational level or the business unit level or the department level. And one of the things that got us thinking about this, I spent many years as a consultant in the automotive industry, both with Japanese companies and American companies. And American companies, talking about the auto manufacturers, no matter what the problem is, reorganizing is the solution. And the issue is, it doesn't change anything. Not only does it not solve anything, it doesn't actually make anything very different because the naturally occurring groups are the same. People don't respond to forced reorganization. So what this whole premise then is based on is that to understand an organization, you have to understand it really from the bottom up. And by the bottom up, I don't just mean from the rank and file up in some managerial paradigm, but I mean from the naturally occurring groups up. So if you look at an entrepreneurial venture, the, the naturally occurring groups are the things that you want to focus on. Now, just one thing more on naturally occurring groups, and again, then we'll sort of jump into this. Often a naturally occurring group will have people in it that either are not a formal member of that group or team, or in some cases, they're not even employees. So in the case of, of the little consulting company that I work for, we've got people that are members of our naturally occurring groups that are spouses, friends, investors, supporters, early clients. But if you looked at just the pure organization chart, those people wouldn't show up as, as being interesting. Just a quick little example, I was at Zappos not too long ago, many of you probably know the company. One of the people that I had lunch with, I couldn't figure out what his role in the company was, so I asked him as we were walking back from lunch, what do you do at Zappos? I don't work here, what do you do? He said, I don't work here either. I'm the UPS rep, or I'm one of the UPS reps. So he is a member of the executive kind of naturally occurring group and is very instrumental in the organization's success, but is not a formal, if you will, member of the tribe. So with all of that being said, here then is where the research led us. You can assess an organization's capabilities by doing two things. Number one, look at the naturally occurring groups the kind of informal networks, who's connected to whom, including people who may not even be members of the organization or members of, of, the, of the corporation, that's number one. And number two, look at the strength, the relative cultural strength of those naturally occurring groups. So the analogy is if you're really going to assess the health of the human body, the unit of analysis might be the cell. Well, the cell in this case is not the person, but the naturally occurring group. And so with all of that said, that lets us do a couple things, okay? Number one, by the time we're done here, you'll have the intellectual framework, you'll be able to really apply this to strengthen your tribes. That actually starts with an assessment, just a mental assessment. What are the kinds of tribes that I have? Are they relatively strong or relatively weak? And then to build those to accomplish more in less time. Now just one thing to say here from the outset, is this is actually not a simple framework, okay? So as we get into it, at first it's going to look very simple. But the questions that are gonna come up will be, but what is the relationship between the person and the tribe? And that's actually a very uh, complex, I mean there's a lot of variables at play, relationship. But if you can really understand how all of that works, it really lets you accomplish both of these, okay? So this is not, if you will, for the faint of mind. It's not uh, do these three steps and you'll build great tribes. It's actually not what we came to at all. Uh, this foundation is used in a lot of business schools because it's something that actually requires a bit of thought. Okay, so we're gonna do this at two levels. Here comes level one. Level one is the kind of macro view. It's a bit of a generalization. So what this says is if you go into any organization and find the naturally occurring groups that exist there, that you can use this sort of temperature gauge 
to figure out if they're relatively effective or relatively ineffective. At the very bottom is everything you don't want, including, and this is not in any way an exaggeration or an attempt at bad humor, people going postal. So at the time that I'm here, one of the things that's in the news is, of course, what happened in Tucson. Okay, when we see level one or stage one tribes at the very bottom, you actually see the behaviors that lead to those types of consequences. Now, they also lead to graft, they lead to fraud, they lead to all sorts of both white and blue collar crime. Okay, that's stage one. Accounts for relatively few of the naturally occurring groups that are employed around the world. Now, societally, it's a bigger problem, but in terms of employment, relatively small. And if we go up to the top, stage five, that isn't exactly where you want to live every moment of your life because it's highly unstable. These tribal configurations are very unstable, as we'll see. But when you kind of come away with this, you see the overall net effect is you want to take your tribes actually to number four, stabilize them there. And once they're stable, then do the things to make occasional leaps into five, which are the groups that are the most innovative and can do things that are really history making in their consequences. So if that makes sense, we're going to jump into this. Again, I'm assuming that you want the premise here to then be able to have a conversation. No, I'm going to stop at least a couple times, probably more, and open it up for any comments, questions. But of course, if you've got any, uh, please stop me as we're going through this. You can either walk up to the microphone. I think some people are watching it remotely and either speak into the microphone or if you just shout it out, I'll repeat what you say so that the people hearing remotely or watching asynchronously can be into the full conversation, okay? So when we talk about stage one, again, this is people going postal. This is fraud of various sorts. This is what we call an undermining group. Now, you'll notice the tribe's language. Okay, we're actually not referring to just the words that people use. We're referring to, I'll use a kind of big concept here, recognizing that Google is a company that, that likes the kind of broader view. It's something called a terministic screen. Now, what does that mean? A terministic screen is a term from actually a rhetorician, guy in the field of rhetoric, in the early 20s and 30s named Kenneth Burke. And what he said is, when a human being is experiencing the world, they've got, they experience it through a set of terms, a screen of terms, screen of words, hence a terministic screen. And so if you think of a, of a physician, one of my co-authors in this project is a doctor, uh, Haley Fisher-Wright, medical doctor. One day we were walking down a street in Los Angeles uh, where I live, she's from Denver, and there was a bad kind of traffic tie up and one of the things that had happened was a car had run into a pole. And so I looked at it through the terministic screen of a guy who lives in Los Angeles and my thought was traffic, how is this gonna affect my getting home? She looked at it through the terministic screen of a physician and recognized that this was likely someone who had a, either a heart attack or a blackout of some kind, perhaps a stroke, and then ended up dry. So she was understanding the situation without thinking about it. Just her instant realization of, of situational analysis was that of a physician. Mine was different. What we see with stage one is the way that people interpret those situations, the terministic screens that are going on in their minds are ones that net out to life sucks or life is inherently unfair. Now, I'm certain when the word comes out about this guy in Tucson, when uh, I'm not particularly looking forward to seeing the video of what actually happened in Tucson, but if you remember the guy who shot at Virginia Tech a number of years ago and then some video came out that he had recorded prior to the incident, he actually repeated the words over and over that life sucks, life is unfair. This is a terministic screen that produces, among other things, terrorism. If you go into parts of the world where people, the way they look at the world, the set of terms that they have to make sense of the world is that life is inherently unfair, they will do whatever it takes to cut a break for themselves. So the behavior pattern that is a natural correlate of this is despairing hostility. People don't have to think about it. It doesn't strike them as a choice that they're making. It's simply this is the way it is, this is their behavior, and that is about as unthinking as you get as it gets. Now, within employed situations, this is only the case, stage one, 2% of the time. The next one is the case 25% of the time. So 25% of naturally occurring groups have this next thing, stage two, as their dominant theme. Now, you notice it says, my life sucks. That may seem very, in terms of words, very similar to stage one. Actually, it's not similar at all. Because in stage one, you have what's sometimes called in psychology a generalized complaint about life, that life just seems set up by its very nature to screw you. That's the, that's the view of life. In stage two, it's not that at all. I can see your life's working fine. I mean, if I got to hang out at Google, my life would be cool. But I don't. I work at USC where life is not nearly as cool. So my life sucks compared to your life. 
And you see this, if you fly, you go through the TSA, that's often a tribe that's kind of the deterministic screen, sort of that life is you know, going well for some people, just not for me. And so the behavior pattern that you see, the center column, we'll get to the values column here in a bit, once we climb a little higher up, it'll make more sense. Behavior pattern that you see is apathy. So if you think about getting your driver's license renewed here in the state of California, there's a good chance if, you're, if you blew it like I did and didn't realize your birthday was coming up and actually had to walk in as opposed to make an appointment, that what you saw was a group of people behaving and you wonder kind of from the outside, is there actually any sort of IQ going on here at all, right? Because people seem to, behaving, to be behaving in a way that is not innovative, that is not inspiring, that is not optimized for much other than taking long breaks, okay? So this is, again, the case 25% of the time. Now, the problem there is it's not fair to say that this is the result of, some, of one particular thing that's going on in the company. So it could be if you've got too much management in a situation, if you've got a project that's not going well, if people feel in some way threatened, their job, something like that, then people can sort of fall into stage two. They adopt this terministic screen. They teach it to each other. It's how sort of the group communicates, right? But what might also happen with a lot of the organizations that you work with, probably not the case here, but probably true of many of your partners, is if people feel like the economy is not working out well for them, that their house is being foreclosed on, things are not going well, they may walk in the door with this terministic screen, that which, or that, that's the thing that they're using to make sense of the world. As a result, you look at their behavior and you see a lot of apathy. Okay, so again, 25% of the time. Now, the next one is the one where we have to spend a bit of time and make sense of it, because this may seem like it's going in a good direction, and then suddenly it takes a very serious kind of right turn in a way that we don't want. So the theme of stage three, this is 48% of employed tribes, and most tribes where people tend to be really smart, very educated, have a lot of degrees, okay? Those tend to, terministic screen, at the very center of the screen, the net of words, are I, me, and mine. So I make sense of things by comparing it to me, right? This is good for me, this is not good for me. So working at a university, it's very common to have a faculty meeting where one person after another will say, well, here's what I think, and here's what I think. And well, from my point of view, and you know, my PhD is in psychology, and from the psychological view, here's what I see, here's what I see, here's what I see. The problem with that is there's very little of a build upon effect. So rarely do you have one person saying, let me take what Michael said and add to it and, and, and try to kind of extend what Michael, see, what Michael said, or let me get on the side of Michael. You actually don't see that. It's one person waiting for the next person to shut up, and then they come in and say what they think. So it turns into conversation without resolution, 48%. And again, it's highest where people are the most equipped, being the most intelligent, the most educated, the most agreed. And so you start talking about a lot of organizations, let's say in Silicon Valley, this is a real problem. And again, you see the limitation. Now let me just pause here at one point. This is probably an obvious conclusion, but just to make sure everybody sees it. If you do nothing more than take a naturally occurring group and move it from one stage to the next, bottom line performance will improve. So if you go from stage one, where people are uh, disconnected from one another, planning accounting malfeasance, committing fraud, and moving to stage two, where they're not getting a lot done, actually your bottom line stuff will improve, right? Between one and two is, that's a step in the right direction. Likewise, between two and three, I mean, would you rather be involved in, let's say that you have a healthcare crisis, would you rather be involved in a situation where it's sort of like the DMB that's caring for you, or would you rather be cared for by a group of kind of super doctors, where every doctor said, okay, I'm, this is my case, everyone shut up, here's, here's the answer, but you had all of them doing it together. See, that would lead actually to medical errors because one doctor is gonna look at it from the point of view of their discipline, but individually, those are all really, really competent people. So clearly three is better than two, and then obviously if we go on to four, this continuing the argument, is now going to improve performance. So when we look at stage four, the way that some people look at this is they, the following, and this is actually incorrect. This is the simple conclusion and it's wrong, okay? Simple conclusion is, oh, I see, this is an I to we argument, this is about the power of we, okay, we wanna say we instead of I. That's actually not the case at all. What happens with a lot of pseudo leaders, people who wanna think that they're leaders, they adopt the language of we, but when you actually look behind the words, what they mean by it is I. 
And so they'll say things like, we've, we've come to this conclusion, we, we're setting this new strategy, we really hope that all of you will be on board with it, and what they mean is, I and my buddies from McKinsey have come up with this new strategy and we really hope you'll like it. In fact, if you don't, then we're gonna argue with you. I realize this is not how life often happens at Google, it is how life happens in a lot of organizations. What I just described is not stage four. It's in fact stage three with kind of an asterisk that people are doing a mental, if you will, search and replace in their head moving from I to we, but that's not stage four. So then if stage four is not just the articulation of we, then what is it? It's coming from the point of view that what binds our naturally occurring group together is a set of shared values. Okay, now we've got to kind of pause here because values is one of the most abused, misunderstood uh, topics in leadership and organizational behavior. And again, I know this is not how Google functions, but how it happens a lot of places is a few people get together uh, around lunch and we kind of come up with what our values are. And it's really our values, kind of four or five people's values, and they get imposed upon the rest of the organization in posters and on mugs. Okay, again, that's not how life happens here, but that's how values are quote unquote set most places. Number one, they have no measurable impact on uh, behavior other than to be, to be a source of ridicule. So how does stage four work? Stage four is where the group gets together and really kind of asks the question, what is it we stand for? So a line that I was uh, reminded of in doing a lot of this research comes from Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther, the guy who founded the Lutheran Church, which was at some point someone said, why are you doing these things? You know, people are going to make life very, very difficult for you. And his answer to, th to that question was, here I stand, I can do no other. Okay, that is a statement spoken by a person that knows, in this case, his or her values. Imagine a group says, here we stand, we can do no other. That's a group that really understands its values. And so then when you start talking about places that are in the news, I mentioned Zappos earlier, they really understand their values. Fun is one of their values. Being a little bit weird or being weird is one of their values. So if you ever have, a, have the chance to, to do the Zappos tour unlike this, you're kind of struck with, wow, this is a really weird place to be. Okay, I, Dave, would make a really bad Zappos employee. I'm really not weird enough. You might have kind of guessed with how I'm dressed, the fact that I hang out in a university. I'm just not weird enough for Zappos. I'm not. You probably aren't either, okay? So it's where the group says, here's what we stand for. Here's who we are. Now, what are ways we can take this set of values and translate it, not necessarily into full-blown strategies, but into more short-term activities? So in the case of Zappos, a famous thing that was written about was the number of new customers that Zappos was plateauing. Now, if you ever hung out in a business school, there's a right answer to that question, and it's advertising and marketing. We need to advertise, we need to market, but again, if you've read the Delivering Happiness book by Tony Shea, you know that, among other things, Zappos was always having a cash problem. They didn't have the money to do that. It also was out of step with their values. So notice what they did with the relationship to values here at stage four being important. They asked the question, who are we, what do we stand for? And in that discussion, which was very ad hoc, very informal, not required by management, not mandated by any sort of quote unquote leaders, then someone stepped forward and no one quite remembers who this was, as I understood the story, I was not in the room when it happened. And a person said, I have an idea, let's offer tours. Okay, which makes no sense. The, if you kind of think about it at first, notice how stage three would make sense of that. Well, you know, I've got my MBA and that's just the wrong answer. Well, that's a really, really stupid thing that that person just said. I can't wait for that person to stop so that I can say what the right answer is and everyone can be moved by my genius and they can all applaud because I have the right answer, which is we need to advertise. That's not what happened. Notice how stage two would respond. Wow, I had no idea that we're that much in the soup. Wow, my life's about to suck. I'm about to be unemployed in Las Vegas, or Henderson, which is next to Vegas. That would be stage two. No ability to innovate, no ability to engage, no traction. But at stage four, there's a curiosity. Just one kind of interesting aside, when we go into stage three organizations, and I would ask as a researcher, or John would ask, John is, is more of a coach than I am, uh, and a lot of the ideas that I'm presenting, actually John, John had early iterations of them when we first met. And so as, as we went in to kind of validate or test a lot of those ideas, we would go into stage three environments and say, who do you trust? And people would have like this whole map worked out of who they trust and, and in what situations. Well, I trust Bob when it's financial and I trust Amy, you know, if it's about a promotion, because I know Amy's got my back and I protected her once. And you go into stage four organizations and say, who do you trust? And people say, what do you mean? Well, I mean, who do you trust? Well, 
I trust people I work with. Well, what would you do if they ever violated trust? Why are you asking such stupid questions? I'd go sit down and talk to them. We'd go play volleyball. We would hang out at the snack bar and work it out. Okay, well, what if you couldn't work it out? I don't know, we'd bring some, why are you asking such stupid questions? It's really not a big issue. Okay, that's more a stage four way of handling it. So back to the example from Zappos. So as the person said, well, let's do tours, you can kind of see the light bulb going off in people's heads. We could bring people in, we could show them what we stand for, it's an inspiring place to work, and it will more importantly start this whole viral thing of then people going back to uh, wherever they're you know, based, how is Vegas, it was okay. Oh, but I saw Zappos, Zappos is really cool. Never heard of Zappos. Wow, you gotta go online, they're really cool. That was actually one of the turning points in the Zappos story, was when they took these tours that they had previously offered to suppliers and so on, and they began to offer it to ordinary customers. So now when the person who brought up the suggestion, who happened to be a, a customer service operator, is on the phone later that same day, and is talking to, let's say, you, and you say, wow, what's that noise in the background? Oh, that's a conga line. A conga line? That's the most bizarre. Where do you work? Well, Zappos is you know, kind of famous for being a little weird. And you've got conga lines at work? Yeah. Well, wow, I would love to see that. Well, hey, we're in Henderson, just outside Vegas. Next time you're here, stop by. Now, we don't have a store. It's not like a retail place. But you can just see what we do and probably give you lunch. Well, well I don't know. You know, money's kind of tight. No, 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 no. Money's not tight. We'll send our shuttles to go pick you up. So for those people that have really kind of sipped from the Zappos Kool-Aid, the fact that the Zappos shuttle is gonna show up at their hotel on the strip and drive them to Henderson where they get the tour and see the conga lines and the chili cook-off and hear all, the, hear all that kind of weirdness was a major kind of going to Mecca event for people. And so you can see how that played out. So we just kind of you know, stop right here. Notice a couple things about stage four. Number one, there's very little drama, okay? It makes really bad reality television. People aren't trying to undermine one another. They're not trying to be smarter than one another. They're not trying to top one another. They don't turn to the camera and say, I'm really not here to make friends, which is a common line from reality TV. It just doesn't happen. It's relatively drama free. Stage three, high drama, makes great reality television and is really soul sucking in its nature because it taps people so much every single day. I feel like I'm personally at war. So I have less energy at the end of the day than I had at the beginning and so on. And stage two is in fact even more in that direction. Uh, the number of stage four you keep in track is about 22%, 22, 23%, depending on how you round. So when we go on to stage five, one of the things about stage five that contrasts it from four is at four there has to be a them, okay? So if I were at Google, one of the concerns that I would have is the them and I'm you know, speaking to friends, and I've got friends in the other group that I'm about to mention, is Microsoft, okay, it's good to have a really, really great competitor, and again, I'm choosing my words very carefully here. So I'll give you an example. At a company called C.B. Richard Ellis, they are a commercial real estate broker company. When I first got in contact with them, their nemesis was a company called Trammell Crow. CB was number one in the market space, Trammell Crow was number two. And this was a worthy competitor, where CB was a street smart company, Trammell Crow was a company that hired, among other things, Harvard MBAs. So this was a company to really war against. And the day came when CB Richard Ellis bought Trammell Crow, and one of the questions is, who's them, right? If we're us, who are we in competition with? And so when that goes away from stage four, you actually have a problem. And what often happens, I'm not saying this will happen here, but what often happens is the culture then regresses to stage three because it's not us against them. Them is not really clearly defined or them is not cool enough, right? So I'm not sure who them is and the culture actually takes a step back. Stage five is the opposite. It's where there is no sense of them other than an abstraction or something like at uh, in the early days of Amgen curing cancer, or if you're familiar with the story of Ray Anderson, one of the, the early environmental CEOs, uh, you know, who's your competition? Carbon. Really, I thought you made carpet. Well, we do, but it's carbon. And this was when nobody was really talking about carbon footprints. So at stage five, we talked to some people at uh, physics lab at MIT, who are you in competition with? Oh, well, you know, it's Caltech. Well, not really, we hire their people. We, do projects together, we're working on the super collider. I, I guess it's knowledge. So it's where the sense of a competitor becomes very, very general. Now within five is a major pitfall, which is why what we encourage based on the research is not for five to be the goal, but instead five to be a place that you visit on occasion. So 
Some of you in this room, I suspect, were involved in dot coms, 99, 2000. We collected some data on those and we asked, who's your competitor? And instead of the competitor being a vibrant company that was actually making money, people would say, our competitor is retailing. And they would, get it, they would say it with this eyes glazed over effect, retailing. Really? Well, don't you need like money and cash flow and things like that? You know, business professor speaking. No, we have clicks. Okay, but it was before they actually had a business model where that made any sense. So notice at stage five, there can be some delusional activity, right? Because we're not measuring ourselves against another, it's hard to benchmark and it's hard to know when we're being effective. So about as good as it gets is for your naturally occurring group to start out wherever you are, you want to move up to four. What does that mean? You have a good knowledge of your shared values. Your shared values actually drive conversation. So it's not enough to simply intellectually know what people value or don't value. It has to drive the conversation in the same way that, that service and being weird and pride of culture drove the conversation in the Zappos example. If you don't have that, then as high as you're going to get on this is going to be three, which again is sub-optimized. So one of the big kind of surprising findings for a lot of companies is you don't want to find the best and brightest and hire them. Now you do, but that's not enough because if you end there, you end up with an organization optimized for stage three. Think of the Manhattan Project, controversial by its nature, but it was much more stage four because it had a sense of, com of a common enemy. So again, you want to take your groups to four where values really drive the conversation. And then every once in a while, take a little leap into five and ask the question, if we were in competition, not with this other group that could be within Google or outside Google, doesn't matter, but if we were in competition with something grander, perhaps in competition with history, what could we really, really do? At the time that I'm here, one of the big things in the news is, of course, the fact that Steve Jobs is stepping down for health reasons. Apple has, on a number of occasions, you saw Michael on a Mac, I got a Mac too, okay? These groups at Apple have come together and said, not how do we beat Microsoft, but how do we do something that by its nature would make history? And you look at the string of, of innovations have really come out of that. But when you come out of that and you're a project manager for something involving the iPhone, you're then gonna track the competition and you're gonna try to do better than them, that's stage four by its nature. Okay, so I mentioned two levels. This is level one. Level one is now, sorry, level two is gonna get more detailed. But let me just stop at this point. Any comments, any questions, any thoughts, any yeah buts, how about, what ifs? Yes, sir. Right. How do you identify like one tribe from another and, and how do they self identify? Is it part of their self identification that they know that they're part of a group and they separate themselves from the group? Just can you flesh out that concept a little bit? Yeah, and so the, the question is just to summarize it for people wa watching or if you didn't hear it, is is since this I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, since the tribe is a bit of a mushy idea, how do people within the organization make sense of which tribe they belong to? Again, paraphrasing, how do you know the boundaries? How do you identify it? There's a couple ways to do it. Uh, one is, is a fairly um, scientific view driven by people in computer science, which is you can, do a, you can do a study where you look to see literally who communicates to whom, and then you can tease out uh, it's called a community identification system. And again and again, if you tease it out, you'll see that these groups form between 20 and 150. The much less scientific and much more mushy way to look at it is simply, who do you talk to? And if you ask someone that question, they are likely to come up with you know, the sort of the people in their tribe. When I was flushing this idea out with John before we met Haley, uh, talked to an anthropologist that had done some work in this field. And one of the points that she made, this was back when PDAs didn't have very much data, that, that there are two ways to kind of tell who's in your quote unquote tribe. One is they were probably in your phone. Now this is when phones didn't include a lot of people. They're probably the numbers you would recognize if someone called. Or anywhere in the world except for New York City, if you saw them walking down the street, you'd stop and say hello. Because even if you saw someone in New York City, it's, that's not how New Yorkers live. So does that make sense? So it, it's a mushy idea by, by, by concept. Where the mushiness goes away is if you actually start thinking about who are in your work tribes, it's actually a very easy question to answer. And we've never met anyone who didn't have a pretty good answer. Now, we've done these studies involving tens of thousands of people of asking who do you communicate with on a regular basis and then asking questions about who, who do you share values with and do you trade information and do you trust them and are they influential? And you can look at that and you can do a community identity. And it, it actually nets out to the same thing. Follow up, yeah. So, part of the 
concept, are people members of local tribes at the same time? Yes. Or do they, okay, so how do they make sense of that? I mean, okay, so the question is, can people be members of multiple tribes at the same time? I said yes. And then your follow-up to the follow-up was then how do they make sense of that? Uh, the short answer is they do make sense of it all the time. People are members of multiple tribes. But how I think it relates back to this idea and how, where I suspect you're going is notice it is incorrect. Sorry, what's your name? Uh, Doug. Doug. So it'd be, it would be an incorrect use of the methodology to say, Doug's kind of a stage two guy. So let's tattoo a two on his head, on his forehead. That way, anywhere he goes, people will know that he's kind of a down in the dumps guy. That's, in, that's incorrect or inaccurate because in one tribe, he may behave in a stage two manner because that's dominant in that tribe. He may go to another meeting that's very uh, individual focused, may communicate in stage three. You might do something that's more giving back to the community, you might have a real sense of values, a charitable activity or philanthropic activity of some kind that could be stage four or even five. And you're the same, you're the same person, but you're communicating differently in those tribes. A very simple example, and again, I, I, I drink from the USC Kool-Aid here, so I mean no disrespect about where I teach. When I have meetings in the full-time MBA program, it's stage three. This is among the faculty. Same group of people. When we have meetings about the executive MBA program, which is a different program, largely same people, it's more a stage four discussion, driven by values, a sense of we that's not forced and not artificial. Same people, but different contexts. So context is really uh, determining here. Make sense? Now this next thing will, will help to, to, to flesh this out a bit more because where this goes then is what is the relation, so this is now level two that I promised, okay. So what is the relationship between the person and the tribe? So if we talk about somebody going postal, this is what it looks like from a sociogram perspective. Sociogram being how we, we, we chart out the network of relationships. So notice the big green blob over here to the right and here's everybody else. I am certain when we discover the motivation of this guy that did this terrible act in Tucson, this will be what we'll see. The person is, has a sense of alienation. The alienation certainly came through if you looked at any of the written materials, the government controls the grammar. I mean, it's kind of insanity. Okay, now if that happened to you, that you started talking like that, your friends and family would do an intervention, okay? But when you're this green dot and you've systematically disconnected from all of your social relationships, there's no sort of safety net. And so this is what stage one that sort of says life sucks looks like. It's a person that's really alienated from any sense of a future, any sense of optimism. Get enough of these green dots together and we have a gang. And we have a group that may spawn terrorism depending on where it is in the world, right? So this is stage one. Stage two, if you're familiar with the TV show The Office, okay, one of the reasons that that show has, has the success that it has is because people all around the world, not just in the US or, or in Britain where the show started, look at that and say, that's where I work, okay? Here's any character, this green dot at the center, any character in The Office. I mean, I'm not disconnected, I'm not sort of off to the side, I'm in the midst of things, but yet I'm not connected. So I'm not alienated, I'm just not connected. So any conversation of values, yeah, I don't have those. So imagine going into the typical kind of TSA group or Department of Motor Vehicles and say, what's your core commitment in life? People would sort of laugh or would say, or they'd give you a sarcastic answer. Uh, brakes, I love taking them. Well, really, let's probe into that. Why do you like brakes? One of the techniques of values assessment is to say what they say and then probe deeper, asking open-ended questions. So why do you like brakes? Well, it beats the heck out of working. I mean, it doesn't actually go anywhere. But at Zappos, if you said, what do you really like about your job? You'd hear something like service. Well, what do you like about service? Well, you know, it makes me happy to serve. Well, okay, and why is happiness so important? I know it just is. That road went down values. But if you find a group that's largely disconnected, so this is in Doug's example, if Doug's a member of a stage two tribe, but also members of higher performing tribes, this is probably his experience in a stage two tribe. Now, stage three gets fun, okay? Here's the dot at the center. I form, if, I'm, if I think kind of, I'm great, I'm great, and you're not, so it's gotta be comparative. I have to be great, you have to be not. What happens in the structure of relationships automatically is we form what are called dyads. So I form my dyadic, die to person relationship with Doug, and I say, look, Doug, you know, I'm great and you're not, but I don't actually say that to Doug, because I want Doug's compliance. So, so I find some way to sort of butter him up. Now notice, this is gonna come across completely fake and artificial. Hey, Doug, you know, Thanks for asking the first question. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I know you got my back. Okay, notice how plastic that seems. But in the world of someone using the terministic screen of I'm great, do I think I'm getting through? Yeah, why? Because I'm great. 
There's a major blind spot, you might even say a kind of reality distortion field, and I'm not talking about Steve Jobs, that comes in with stage three. It's the nature of the beast. So what do I do? I form all of my dyadic relationships, if you're the people in my tribe, and then I try to make you clones, which is why the color becomes the same, of me. And this is great for me, because now I've talked to all of you, and I've made you like me, and sure, you're not quite as good as me, you're not quite as smart as me, you don't quite have the background that I have, but you know, for what you are, you're good. And more importantly, now we can get stuff done. Problem is you come back to work unchanged because you know you went home and you talked about it, you slept, and now you want to, no, we're not having discussions. Doug, we already talked about this. Remember, you said you were gonna offer your support. So I try to change you back, and we wonder why stage three naturally occurring groups are so dramatically ineffective, okay? So we're almost done with this. So if we take a look then at stage four, it looks completely different. And you might have noticed this weird little spinning character up in the upper uh, left of the screen. This will now make sense. So uh, some of you might be familiar with Reid Hoffman, one of the people who founded LinkedIn. Uh, one of the uh, interesting things that we identified in, in talking with Reid and other people is that actually the basic building block of a stage four, remember this is a group that's driven by its values, where the values really drive the conversation, is not a dyadic relationship, but a triadic. So how does this work in practice? As Reed said, the reason I brought him up, is first of all, you do have to know the people. Reed talked about the theory of small gifts, you know, gift that I give. Small as in it doesn't have to be valuable, but every six months, a year, I need to reach out to people in my network, remind you that I remember you, that you're important to me. And then when I do that, I can find two people and I can connect them. I can sort of match make. Now at stage four, the matchmaking is very systematic, but yet we discovered people were doing it without thinking about the system. They were just doing it because it seemed natural. So what was it that they were doing? The levels of connection are number one. If I'm introducing Doug and Michael, I gotta find some reason why you should connect, some business reason, some project reason. Michael's working on this project, Doug can help. Oh, Doug, you mentioned you're having that one problem. Michael can either help or he knows somebody who does. So I find a reason to connect. Now, if that's all I did, that would be very stage three because it's based on commodities and problem solving skills. The other levels, I've gotta find a value that you share a value as in a core value, something that's important to both of you. Now, Doug, I just met. Michael, of course, I've known for many years. So as I'm meeting Doug, I'm mentally kind of going through my list to see how can I introduce him to Michael in a way that will speak not just to your short-term problem that you want solved, but also to something more enduring. So I build the connection at both of those levels. And then, of course, being people who deal with networks all the time, you know how quickly you, th this can scale, which is why the, the logo, and I'm just saying this as an explanation, there's no way a plug, if you notice this little swirling logo, the logo of our company is a triad because what we've found is, is one of the best ways to take a group that is individually competitive stage three and get them up to stage four is to encourage more triadic values-based relationships that involve three people. So notice if I connect Michael and Doug, it's triadic because I'm the third member of that triad. I've connected them. And then this can, of course, scale very quickly. So on the basis of that, then we can really answer Doug's question about how do we know who's in what group. So take a look at what's up here. This is an actual little sociogram of the network side, the structural side of a tribe. And so you can just you know, shout out if you know the answer. What, you know, move my uh, cursor here so I won't get away from the microphone. What do you see right here? What stage? Four. Four, because you notice triadic relationships. How about right here? Three because I'm great and you're not and you're not and you're not. So I put you in your place, I give you your assignment and then I micromanage you and treat you like a commodity. But notice here, I'm great, no, I'm great, no, I'm great. It's like the movie The Highlander, there can be only one. That's like a faculty meeting at USC, conversation without resolution. Here we've got another little hub and spokes so at three. Here we've got four. So who's great? We are. Who's not great? This group, okay? So notice the intervention then that you can make if you do what Doug, what in my answer to Doug's question about just notice who's connected to whom, they aren't all necessarily speaking the same language. In this tribe, you hear stage four spoken, you hear stage two spoken, my life really sucks. You hear stage three spoken, I'm great and this person's not and I'm in an epic life and death struggle with them. And to kind of re-engineer the tribe is relatively simple. All we did to get, this is the before, this is the after, is really two things. Number one, teach people how to triad and encourage them to triad themselves. And number two, encourage them to encourage others to triad. So if you take that two levels down, now you'll notice you see a lot more stage four across the board. So the interventions then become relatively, not just easy, but obvious. So when you see hub and spoke behavior, that's where you want to introduce triads. 
Do you want to introduce triads when you see stage two behavior? No, they're not ready for it, okay? So that's kind of then the two levels. Level one is linguistic, just to recap and then see comments, questions you have. Level one is linguistic, terministic screens. Remember, not just the language that people speak, but more the set of terms that they use to make sense of their world. And then level two that is correlate with it, that goes along with it, uh, is structural. And Bottom line, you want to take, if you really want to optimize for effectiveness and energy level and innovation and things that you really care about as, I know, both individuals and as a company, you want to take your groups to stage four. If they're not, stabilize them using triad values-based communication. And then every once in a while, move up to four, ask those sort of Apple questions, and then move down to four and stabilize. When you do that, you're actually in the top 7% of naturally occurring groups, which are those stable at four, able to take an occasional leap up to five, do something history making, come back down, and then get down to business. Okay? Comments, questions about any of this? Any thoughts at all? Doug! Yeah. Um, I got your back. Uh, I got your back. Uh, so sometimes there's like organizational hierarchies. Right. And the tribes, especially when you talk about taking like people at level two and sort of bringing up level three, where they're basically working, you know, with one sort of central like manager sort of person, right? Right. Um, they may not align, you know, the, the organizational structure and the people they might actually work effectively with don't don't match. So, so what do you do in a case like that, where you have, you know, some owners or some apathetic people, their manager is for whatever reason just not able to connect with them. Um, there's no natural person. Okay, so the, the question, again, is, is a very good one, which is what if you have a person that is disconnected and the, and the manager is incapable of connecting with them, so then what do you do in that kind of hierarchical situation? Uh, the obvious answer is you need to find someone, not necessarily in the hierarchy, in fact, in fact, almost always not in the management hierarchy, that will connect to them. Now, having said that, let me just go off on a tangent, but this is really important and frankly is the reason I get out of bed every morning besides the need to use the restroom, but that's something I won't bore you with. So but the problem with management is by its nature, it's stage three, by its nature. So if Doug works for me, okay, Doug, come and see me. It's called a one-on-one, -on -one, notice dyadic relationship. And then what do I tell Doug? Look, Doug, I need you to do these three things, okay? These three things, don't do anything else, just these three things. And in the end of a year or six months, I do an appraisal of Doug where I tell him how he did and then I offer him some kind of incentive or reward for having done or not done those three things. If he didn't do those three things, then I show him the door as a sign to all of you, you better get in line. The nature of that is I'm great, you're not, dyadic relationship, not triad, and there's values present nowhere in that. It, everything is commoditized. So in the setup, you said, what about a manager? What I would say is someone in management is often not set up to do this unless they step out of their formal hierarchical role and really connect in more of a tribal or network fashion. So you see the point? Someone in management may find it really difficult is it will come across as an I'm great, you're not intervention. They already know that they're not great and not doing a great job and not connected. That doesn't solve their problem or in any way add value. In fact, that only reinforces it. So the cure for stage two and three behavior is not management. It's in fact less management. It's a lot more leadership. Yes, over here. You said uh, a stage four needs a damp. Yes. And you talked about taking a tribe to stage four. So does that mean creating a damp or promoting a damp? Yeah, so the question is, since stage four requires a them, does it, do we then need to, to come up or manufacture or identify them? The answer is yes, you do. Now, if you don't manufacture them, the group may produce a them, which may not be a them that you want, okay? Because often them will be the next tribe over that in fact you actually, you know, sort of need their help. This happens a lot in, in armed services and things where the, the group that we're in competition with is another group within the same. That's not what you want. So like in the case of C.B. Richard Ellis, the problem was they had to manufacture a competitor worthy of competition. Because if they went with the next player in the, in the market, I won't mention the name, but it, it wasn't someone that was worthy of a, of a company of that capability and, and caliber. So what you want to do as a leader is 
and I'm not just saying that you stand up and say they are the enemy, so I declare it, that's stage three. You go into the group and, and you ask them, you know, who should we be competing against? If we were really to come up with the best possible competitor, what would it be? And great leaders and companies will often set two groups in a friendly competition and set you know, a, a purely symbolic prize. The winner of it gets this little clicker. But it's symbolic, and that encourages that. So if you do it in a, in a systematic, thoughtful way, instead of simply finding another group to beat up against because we want to, you can use the natural competition to your benefit. Otherwise, it can really work against you. Thank you. That answer the question? Yeah. Okay, any other? We just got a couple minutes here. Doug again. Is there a lower limit on the number of people you need for a tribe? So yeah, the, the question is, what's the lower end on, on tribes? Uh, can you have a group at? Yeah, I mean, can, can you have can you have a group at two? So what happens when you have a group of people and it's smaller than twenty? What hap So the, the what happens below twenty is exactly the same dynamics, but because the the number of people is smaller, they'll jump around on that tribal map. They won't really be stable. There won't be a way that we communicate. One of the definitions of culture coming from two researchers named Deal and Kennedy is the way we do things around here. There kind of is no way we do things around here because it's such a small group, because you've got two, three people. If you add another one to the group, it completely changes the dynamic. But if you've got 20 people and you add a 21st, probably that 21st person will adapt his or her behavior instead of the group of 20 modifying. The only exception, just to be kind of honest with the, you know, with the, with the findings here, is if that person is someone of remarkable caliber in some, let's say that you've got a group of 20 and Barack Obama joins your group. Your group will radically change because Barack Obama just joined the group. But outside of those situations, adding that N plus one person doesn't lead to a dramatic change. So after 20, you find a point of stability. Okay, we have time for one more comment question, if there is one. Okay, well then, uh, two things and I'll, and I'll wrap it up. These are both very short. Number one is I really appreciate you being here. Very much appreciate the opportunity to, you know, to come to Google. I mean, I, I know you hear this all the time, but as someone who's in the field of, of education, I've been teaching college since 1990, been full-time on the, on the Marshall School, the USC Business School faculty since 95. Uh, I mean, I just can't get over what a revolution you have created in the world. I mean, I think back to doing my dissertation. I was going to checking out books. I mean, that just seems so, I'm telling my, my grad students how I did my, my PhD, and it sounds like something out of the Flintstones. I mean, really, the, what you've contributed has just been, I think when our children's children look back, this will be one of the really epic moments in history, largely because of what you do every day, individually and together. That's a short way of saying thank you. Really appreciate what you do. I mean, it is dramatic and it is transformational. Uh, and number two, and this is really personal uh, you know, to Michael, I really thank you for the opportunity to be here, the opportunity to meet many of you and, uh, and to spend some time. So, and if you're watching remotely, thank you very much. <laughs>